A very good evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Victoria Memorial Hall for this illustrated lecture on Gods and Demons, a Raging bot Battle, Thoughts and Images from Indian Paintings by Professor B.N. Goswami. Uh, we are having the honor and privilege of having Professor Goswami after a lapse of nearly seven years. He was here when the Shakti Burman show was on at that time, and then after this lapse of about seven years, we are lucky to have him again to address us on this very important, vital topic, which is a part of each one of ourselves. We all think about gods and demons all the time, uh, even when there are no demons. But nowadays, in times we are living in, there are real demons, and we have to be careful about them. So uh, before uh, we hand over the microphone to Professor Goswami, may I request Dr. Joyantho Chengupta, the secretary and curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, to kindly welcome the audience and introduce the speaker for this evening. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's lecture by the doyen of Indian art historians, Professor B. N. Goswami, on the fascinating subject of gods and demons, a raging battle, thoughts and images from Indian paintings. It's an absolute honor for us in the Victoria Memorial Hall to have him speak tonight. When I was the director in charge of the Indian Museum from 2015 to 2017, and I inaugurated the painting gallery, the magnificent painting gallery of that museum in 2016, I invited him to come and inaugurate that gallery. He was unable to come then because he was traveling abroad. But he told me, I would come and speak at your museum. So here he is. He had remembered that promise, so this time, when he was visiting for a workshop at the Kolkata Center for Creativity, he himself called me and reminded me of the promise he had made back in 2016. That brings him here tonight, and so we are so very grateful to you, Professor Goswami, for this enormous kindness on your part. Uh, Professor B. N. Goswami, of course, needs no introduction to this audience. He is a star. But as a host, I have to do a small routine of saying something about our stellar speaker, in any case. Over a career spanning more than six decades, he has accomplished so much through his magnificent scholarship and vision that it is frankly impossible for me to convey that in a couple of minutes' time. So I'll just reveal something new that may not be known to everybody, that he began his career by ranking in the top 10 of the Indian Administrative Service. Indian Administrative Service Examination in 1956. And indeed, he joined the service for a couple of years before, and I'll speak, I, I'll say this in spite of Jahorda's presence here, uh, before better sense prevailed, and he quit the service in 1958 <laughs> to chart out the path that has made him into one of the most iconic figures in Indian art history. Professor Goswami, is the Professor Emeritus of Art History in Punjab University, which also happens to be his alma mater, and the institution where he had been a professor for more than three decades, and the Dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts, and a member of the Senate for considerable lengths of time. The universities and institutions worldwide where he has held visiting professorships include the University of Heidelberg, the University of California at Berkeley, the University of California at Los Angeles, University of Pennsylvania, the University of Zurich, the University of Texas at Austin, the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, Jawaharlal Nehru University, the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Shimla, and Punjabi University in Patiala. He has delivered invited lectures in innumerable universities, museums, foundations, and other institutions of learning, including such prestigious endowment or memorial lectures as the Polsky Lectures at the Asia Society in New York, the Bagri Foundation Lectures at the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London, the Ryan Lecture at the Colgate University in New York State, the Ananda Kumaraswamy Memorial Lectures at the Prince of Wales Museum, Mumbai, the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Shangralai, and later at the Lolit Kala Academy in New Delhi, the Olive Rose Memorial Lecture at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, the Lucy and Jim Hall Distinguished Lecture at the San Diego Museum of Art, 
the Abhinandanath Tagore Memorial Lecture at the Regional Lalit Kala Academy and Birla Academy of Art, Kolkata, the Ram Kinkar Beige Memorial Lecture for the Masui Foundation in New Delhi, the V. S. Gaitonde Memorial Lecture at the Reza Foundation in New Delhi, the first memorial lecture in honor of the late artist K. G. Subramaniam at Baroda, the Sachi Lecture at the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco, and many, many others. He has held many distinguished fellowships, including, among many others, the Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship, the John D. Rockefeller Fellowship, the Milan Senior Fellowship of the National Humanities Center in North Carolina in the United States, and the Tagore National Fellowship in Cultural Research, awarded by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, London, the Royal Asiatic Society, London, and a member of the American Oriental Society, a former trustee of both the Victoria Memorial Hall and the Indian Museum, and is or has been a member of the governing committee of the Indian Council of Historical Research, a member of the Academic Council of Jawaharlal Nehru University, a member of the Central Advisory Board on Culture of the Government of India, a member of the Executive Board of the Lalit Kala Academy in New Delhi, and Chairman of the Advisory Board of the National Museum in New Delhi. In 2000, he received the Rittberg Award for Outstanding Research in Art History from the city of Zurich in Switzerland. In 2016, he was chosen for the Art Writer of the Year Award by India Today. In 1998, he was awarded the Padma Shri and in 2008, the Padma Bhushan by the President of India. More than 30 books and hundreds of articles bear testimony to Professor Goswami's magnificent scholarship, many of which will be familiar to this audience. I'll just name a few of them. The Painters at the Sikh Court, published by Franz Steiner Verlag in Weisbaden in 1975. Krishna, the Divine Lover, from Edita in Switzerland in 1982. A Place Apart, Paintings from the Kutch, published by Oxford University Press in Delhi in 1983. The Essence of Indian Art, published by Asian Art Museum in San Francisco in 1986. Rasa, Le Nouveau Visage, Depart Indian, by Musée Gumet in Paris in 1986. Wonders of a Golden Age, Painting at the Court of the Great Mughals, published by the Museum Rittberg in Zurich in 1987. Pahari Masters, Court Painters of Northern India, published from Zurich in 1992. Nainsukh of Guler, a great Indian painter from a small hill state, published by Artibas Eshi in from Zurich in 1997. Piety and Splendor, Sikh Heritage and Art, published by the National Museum in Delhi from 2000, in 2000. Domains of Wonder, Selected Masterworks of Indian Painting, published by the San Diego Museum of Art in 2005. I See No Stranger, Early Sikh Art and Devotion, published by the Rubin Museum of Art in New York in 2006. Masters of Indian Painting, 1100 to 1900, which was co-edited with Milo Bich and Eberhard Fischer in two volumes, published from Zurich in 2011. The Spirit of Indian Painting, Close Encounters with 101 Great Works, 1100 to 1900, published by Penguin and Allen Lane in 2014. Manaku of Guler, another great Indian painter from a small hill state, published from Zurich and Delhi in 2017. And Oxford Readings in Indian Art with Vrinda Agarwal, published by Oxford University Press in Delhi in 2018. And uh, he told me that his latest book is just out and it's on the Mysore Bhagavat Puran, called the Mysore Bhagavat, which is, which is just out. Several of these books have their origins in magnificent exhibitions in the leading museums of the world that he himself has curated. And that's all I have to say. I only hope Professor Goswami will forgive me for making a really pitiable job of trying to condense his stellar accomplishments in a couple of minutes. Like all of you, I look forward to a riveting lecture by Professor Goswami, which he is known for. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor B.N. Goswami to speak on gods and demons, a raging battle, thoughts and images from Indian painting. And before we begin, please take a moment to take out your cell phones and turn it off or in silent mode. And I will do that in front of you. Please do that.
<coughs> we don't take very kindly to people who disobey the director. And I think Raju Raman will repeat that advisory or warning, <laughs> if you will, in his own inimitable style. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. No, before I repeat the advisory, I would like to request you, Jayanta, to kindly felicitate Professor uh, Goswami with a memento on behalf of Victoria Memorial Hall. Yeah, I probably don't have to repeat this advisory, except for latecomers, if you could already tell them at the gate uh, in case they don't listen to this advisory. Uh, we were having a little chat upstairs with uh, Professor Goswami before we came down here. And from the gist of what I understood from the conversation, gods wouldn't be gods if there were no demons. And demons wouldn't be demons if there were no gods. Yeah, So every god has a past and every demon has a future. Uh, and, and that's the kind of gist that I got. And I also got to understand that like our elected politicians, gods and demons are also succumbing to the temptation of crossing the floor. So if a mobile phone rings, even gods may become demons on the other side. So please switch off your mobile phones. And Professor Goswami, the microphone is all yours. <coughs> to say that I am honored is an understatement. I am overwhelmed by the kindness shown to me and by the graciousness of the invitation. There are so many familiar faces that I saw outside, upstairs, with reminded of a couplet by Faiz Ahmad Faiz, the great poet, Har Ajnabi Hame Mehram Dikhai Deta Hai all strange faces appear to be familiar whenever I pass through this particular street of yours. You'll have to, the reason why I'm citing Fez is that I am in this unfortunate or fortunate habit of lapsing into poetry from time to time. I hope you have the stomach for it. And if you do not understand Persian or Urdu, I'll try and translate it. But I will not overdo it. I hope I won't. Two things at the very beginning. There are many names for demons, many categories of demons, many categories of gods. But the generally adopted names, the gods are called devas and the demons called asuras. Not suras, but asura. So there are a number of other names which will creep in. I'll basically stick to deva and asura. Two or three things which I wish to emphasize at the very beginning. One of the texts, in fact, different texts from India, call the body a daivasuram. The human body, the human mind, is a daivasuram. It has deva and asura all inside it. It is a combination, it is a conjoint kind of a phenomenon. So good and evil are very simple categories, black and white. But there are no blacks and whites necessarily. The prevailing color is gray. And therefore, we have to understand, as, as was said, the gods can turn into demons, demons turn into gods, and so on and so forth. That is not, that is typically Indian. That is the way we think, that is the way we live, that is the way, in a certain sense, our minds are conditioned by the stories we hear, by the milk we drink at our mother's breast, by the air we breathe. So the point is that this whole business of gods and demons being black and white is something that we need to cast out of our system from the very beginning.
another thing which may be of marginal interest to those of you who are deeply involved in the arts of India is something of a story which is peripheral to what I am going to say. Not a story, but a passage in an old text called the Jaimini Sutra, a Vedic text. And in that, there is a very, very elaborate and brilliant passage about the battles between gods and demons. Very often the demons are in the ascendant. And very often, as often, the gods are receding. So when in one of those great encounters the demons attack, the gods are in a problem, they run to Brahma. They run to Brahma to seek a remedy. How do we do this? How do we challenge, how we counter the challenge that the demons are posting us? And Brahma, the great progenitor, the Pitamaha says, recite the Sama, Sama Veda. The gods assemble, they in, stand in a phalanx, and in loud voices they start reciting chants from the Sama Veda. Hearing this, the demons recede, the demons go back. The gods are happy. Few years later, years means few eons later, the demons attack again. And this time again the gods are on the on the on the <coughs> losing side, so run back to Brahma and say, they are back. What do we do? And Brahma says, What did you recite? And the gods say we recited the richas from the Samaveda. He says, but that is foolish. I didn't ask you to sing any words. Just sound. Simple sound. The sound, I mean, that fills the universe. Just abstract. Nothing else. Not a word. When they do that, when they only recite not recite, but sing out aloud what is pure music. The demons recede. Extraordinary episode, which was brought to my attention by a wonderful scholar called Mukundalat. A very, very early reference to pure abstraction. The power of abstraction. <coughs> The power of leaving out the unnecessary, what is superfluous and so on, and concentrate upon what is the essence of things. As I said, this is peripheral to our theme, gods and demons. But I think somewhere at the back of our minds we have to keep that. That there are elements here which we don't fully understand. I was talking to Jawar Sarkar a moment ago and he was very engaged in the origins of demonology or demons and so on and so on. And uh, rightly so. Where do they come from? What is extraordinary, and this is something we don't often realize, at least to the extent that we should, that gods and demons are born of the same seed. The great Rishi Kapil is a progenitor. He has many wives, many wives. And from one wife, Aditi, are born gods. From another wife, Diti, are born Daityas, the sons, the children, the progeny of there is a woman, the wife of his called Danu, and Danu's children are Danavas, again demons. One is surprised. There is a wife of his called Muni. From Muni's womb are born Apsaras. <coughs> so this couple, this divine couple, Kapil and his wife, is not one wife, but a number of wives. 
are born gods on the one hand and demons on the other. The demons are various categories. There are Daityas and Dhanavas and Yatudhanas, Nishacharas and so on and so forth. I do not have the ability to be able to tell you exactly what are the characteristics of this particular demon or that particular demon and so on. But Daityas and Dhanavas and Asuras and Yatudhanas all come from the same seed from which gods come. Have you realized this ever? I doubt it. I do not think we pay attention to this kind of thing. The, so what is happening? I mean, whether it is Hiranyakashapa or it is Hiranyaksha, they come from the same seed. If we realize this, if we are aware of this, even marginally, then I think our thinking begins to change. Then I think in a certain sense a transformation within ourselves begins to take place. The seed of understanding is sown in the soil of our minds. No blacks, no whites, grays. But when the painter who has to you know, visualize or envision great works, text, whether it is in Bhagavad Purana or the Ramayana or the Mahabharata, 